Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change, Thank you for being with us tonight. We have Dr. Lawrence E. Jones. He's the Vice President of the International Programs, the Edison Electric Institute. And Lawrence, it's really fantastic having you back with us because the work you're doing is outstanding and it really does cover the globe. So tell us a little bit about EEI, what is it? So Edison Electric Institute is the trade association that represents all investor-owned utilities in the United States. Uh, they have operations in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia providing electricity for about 220 million Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide public policy leadership as an organization. We also work to make sure we uh, provide strategic business intelligence for our members and then most importantly we convene events and conferences to allow them to have dialogue and exchange ideas on where the industry is going. Now looking at the, the international reach you have, there's a number of countries that you deal with, a number of chapters that you have abroad. Why the international aspect of this? I mean, Edison was an American, and, yeah. uh, but you know, his inventions went global. So your outreach now as far as international programs, why is that important? And are you covering the whole globe? We're basically covering the whole globe. So we have about uh, seven international members that have operations in about 90 countries across the globe. Mm -hmm. If you combine our U.S. members as well as international members, the organization members provide about electricity for about 4 billion people around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important because as we know, the, the world is very interconnected. Uh, electricity is becoming more and more used across the world, very important for sustainable development. And I think what's also very important, uh, Sam, is that we, we, we focus on the importance of a a shared global vision in terms of electrifying the world and bringing sustainable development to various parts of the world. So the international program is an integral part of what EEI does and it allows for organizations both in the U.S. and other parts of the world to exchange and share ideas with one another. Yeah. Now looking at the Millennium uh, uh, Sustainable Goals mm -hmm. that we have as far as the United Nations is concerned, why are those so important and why is EEI really involved in those and at least three of those uh, well, most important. Yeah, I think the, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals is critical because as we know, the planet still has about uh, a billion people who don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to clean water, they don't have access to uh, health. So all of these things are pivotal. And I think from the perspective of EI, what we do in terms of providing access to information for, for expanding the access to electricity, I think is very important. The other thing, why we focus, the other reason why we focus on electricity in terms of sustainable development goals is because everything centers around electricity. If you don't have electricity, half of the goals cannot be met. In fact, most of the goals cannot be met. So everything from health, education, uh, industrialization, all of these things center around electricity. And so for us, it's pivotal to get electricity at the forefront of these discussions across the globe. Yeah, and let's not leave this because, you know, uh, water is life. So we have to have water, that's number one. Mm -hmm. But people are saying in the 21st century, electricity or electrical power of any kind, whatever mm -hmm. source it comes from, mm -hmm. is the second major goal that we need to achieve. Mm -hmm. So it's universal. Yes. And how does the EEI help in that? And what leadership role is it taking to make sure that the electricity mm -hmm. is universal? I mean, part of, part of what's happening is that we've recognized that electricity as a global uh, fuel, if you may, is something that is critical not just for modernization of economies, but also for making sure that people have a sustainable living. And the leadership role we play as an organization is making sure we can convene events that allow 
electric company leaders from across the globe to share best practices. Mm -hmm. We also work very intimately with regulators and policymakers because we've recognized that nothing is more important than making sure you have the right policy framework. And the public policy work that EEI does, both in the U.S., but also sharing ideas with other organizations around the world, is fundamental to being able to achieve some of these goals. And then lastly, I will talk about the customers. Across the globe, customers, both in the U.S. and other countries, recognize the importance of electricity. And so working to make sure electricity is understood and used in a way that is cleaner increasingly, but also that brings value to our customers across the globe, I think is central to how we achieve a global understanding of uh, sustainable development. Now looking at the, uh, the backup generator, that is almost the, the, the national grid in many countries, particularly mm -hmm. on the African continent. Yes. But this is something that most people want to go away because mm -hmm. they're using diesel, a lot yep. of it's very filthy uh, fuel. That's correct. Uh, it's quite expensive. Yes. So how are you actually evolving the, the grid, if mm -hmm. you will, and uh, having this uh, universal access to electricity as almost a human right as far as where we're going in the 21st century. And how can we mentally and emotionally get to that point where having access to energy really should be a universal right? Yeah, I think understanding the issue of providing electricity has to be seen from three aspects. One, from a technology standpoint, we have to have a sort of a hybrid approach to how we do it, go about doing it. So today across the globe, you have Rural electrification is a big issue in many countries. And so you need to consider both the off-grid solutions for rural communities, but also you have to focus on the urban communities where you have huge population centers that need electricity. So you need both off-grid and on-grid solutions in terms of providing electricity. The next thing is affordability. We have to really understand that electricity has to be affordable, but that doesn't mean that it's sort of made affordable to the point where the utilities cannot be able to recover the investments they make. So there's a balance between affordability mm -hmm. as well as accessibility. And then lastly is this issue of sustainable development, looking at sustainability. Already across the globe, we understand that power sectors around the world are making significant progress in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also doing things to make sure we're bringing cleaner energy to different parts of the world. So I think those three things, understand the importance of affordability, mm -hmm. making sure that you have accessibility as part of the equation, and then lastly, sustainability, making sure that the, the grid is providing increasingly cleaner energy across the globe. That, I think, is very central to what we do. How are you looking at as far as accessibility? I've been in you know almost 60 developing countries now, mm -hmm. and you can be standing under power lines going across you know, villages, maybe even almost uh, lo very large towns mm -hmm. of 100,000 people. Yes. And the line's going right over top, mm -hmm. and people are still using backup generators. Yeah. So looking at accessibility, how are the utilities, utilities that you're working with mm -hmm. actually working with the local governments, but also the local communities, yeah. so that they are realizing access to that power, literally maybe passing right over top of their head? Yeah, I think the issue of accessibility is, is one that has multiple angles or multiple points to consider. I think, first of all, we have to make sure accessibility is also affordable. Mm -hmm. And that's where the first conversation starts, right? So what do you do to make it affordable? Well, part of the equation is for a long time across the globe, people have viewed electricity in silo where they thought about just bring a power plant and all of a sudden the lights will come on. Well, I believe going forward, we have to do it in a much more integrated way where you look at the economy, the ability for people to pay for electricity means they have jobs. Mm -hmm. For them to have jobs means you need to have industrialization or some economic development policy, right? And so if you look across the globe today, most countries where you have high levels of electricity, electrification, mm -hmm. is where you have industrialization, you have enough commercial customers and industrial customers, as well as residential customers. In many parts of the developing world, you don't have a strong commercial and industrial sector. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it becomes difficult for utilities or electric companies to provide electricity at a cost-effective way because if most of your consumers are residential customers, obviously it's going to be difficult to recover all the investments. So you need mm -hmm. to take an integral approach to how you go about developing the, the resources that's necessary for electricity. And that's where I think we need to focus on as a globe affordability, uh, sustainability, and increasingly looking at the issue of uh, making sure we have the, the right uh, reg regulatory and policy incentives mm -hmm. in place. Looking at uh, many countries where you have maybe half the population living on two dollars or less a day, yes. how does that, how do you address the affordability of that? Mm -hmm. Because 
you know, even in those informal economies, they are paying for energy. Yes. It may be wood, it may be charcoal, it may be diesel, it may be a combination of all three of those. Mm -hmm. And those, even in those types of economies, actually are expensive vis-a-vis -vis what they make on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So how do we define affordability in such countries? Yes. So it makes sense, and it makes sense also to the investors yeah. who are actually putting in the infrastructure for that. Well, that's a very, very complicated question in terms of the fact that there are so many moving parts when it comes to making affordability sort of uh, done in a way that makes sense, right? Now, what I would think is in terms of uh, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the real challenge, which is where you have a lot of the access, a lack of access issue, mm -hmm. the real challenge there is that rural development hasn't developed, hasn't gone hand in hand with urban development. And so what is happening is you have a lot of people who are leaving the rural communities, coming to the urban communities, really cannot afford to live in the urban communities. So they end up living in, you know, in slums, they end up living in sort of a sub subpar areas. And that creates some sort of disparity in the system in terms of having so many people in these countries who have moved into the urban communities but cannot afford it. And now the question is, how do you get them to develop the rural community? By doing development in the rural community, you begin to develop the culture of paying your bills. Mm -hmm. You also can use electricity to produce uh, what I would call productive uses in those mm -hmm. communities. So for example, agriculture, uh, farming, uh, providing uh, schooling, mm -hmm. using those kinds of uh, off-grid solutions and coming up with new innovative ways of thinking. For example, in certain communities, the issue may not be selling electricity. It may be selling different services that are bundled together where electricity is just part of the equation, right? So, yeah. so I think we need to think con constructively, new thinking outside the box, and don't assume that what has worked in the OECD countries will automatically work in developing countries. There needs to be new thinking around this whole issue of electrification and accessibility. So it really leads us to distributed energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, many off-grid opportunities yes. as far as solar, low-flow hydro, uh, can be uh, many other types, mm -hmm. of course. So how do we balance that as far as these large grid centric uh, systems that yeah. we have in North America, mm -hmm. Western Europe, and some parts of Asia yeah. that maybe you know, is passe and just will not work in some of these countries? Or do you believe actually we need to really stay focused on the grid and bring all these communities along to this concept in every one of these countries? You do, you do need both. And this is the thing I tell people all the time. Oftentimes when people discuss the idea of getting off the grid, what they don't recognize is once you give a consumer one light bulb, mm -hmm. eventually they're going to want two, and they're going to want three. So scalability becomes a key issue. Mm -hmm. So I understand you can small, start small in a rural community, but imagine that those communities will eventually expand. And so you need the grid. The grid is actually important for industrialization. Mm -hmm. You need the grid for urban communities. If you're looking at, in the next 20, 30 years, an additional 100 million to 300 million people moving into urban communities in Africa, for example, mm -hmm. there is no way you can provide electricity for all of those people just based on off-grid solutions. So you need to think a, a hybrid approach. You need off-grid solutions, but you need grid solutions. And in terms of scaling up electricity access, mm -hmm. it makes actually more sense if you build large centralized systems. However, there needs to be a room to integrate distributed energy resources as well as the large central plants. And there are a lot of experiences being developed right now mm -hmm. in the US, in Europe, where distributed energy resources are coming together with the central power station because you have this huge demand for energy. So it's not an either or proposition, which is what most people argue about. I think it needs to have both and have a hybrid mindset in terms of how we develop electricity systems. Hybrid and let it run in tandem. We have exactly. about uh, 20 seconds left. Where do you see EEI going over the next 5, 10, or 15 years? I think we, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, we're gonna continue to focus on what's important for our members, both in the US and around the world making sure that the issue of affordability is at the forefront, serving our customers, but most of all, making sure we do it in a way that's sustainable for the planet. Yes, we have Dr. Lawrence uh, E. Jones, Vice President, International Programs, Edison and Electric Institute. Thank you for being with us on Emerald Planet TV. Thank you for watching and looking at this uh, concept of how we marry together water, energy, and all the other resources that we need as we move through the 21st century and create the Emerald Planet.